All right, thank you everyone for joining us uh, to talk about Swift Rings. Um, I see a lot of Swift contributors in the room. They will keep us honest for the rest of you. I hope you're ready to dive into some technical stuff. Christian will guide us, I'm sure. All right, thank you very much, Clay. So, yeah, my name is Christian Speter. I'm a principal engineer working at Red Hat. Um, Clay described me as a stand up guy, whatever that means. Yeah, Christian's um, really good. It's nice guys. Uh, so, yeah, and with me is Clay. Yeah, I'm Clay Gerard. I work at uh, SwiftStack, which is another company that's contributing to Swift in addition to Red Hat. Uh, I am a senior software engineer there, and I've been working on Swift for quite a while. All right, so we cleared that. Yeah. Yes. Okay, we're, this, uh, another title for this talk could have been Rings 201. Um, there, Swift has been around for a long time. Uh, it is a deeply entrenched open source technology. There's a lot of information out there available for Swift. Um, and we wanted to take this opportunity in front of a video that's being recorded to go a little bit deeper on some of the um, really important technology that uh, builds up Swift. So in this talk, we want to first talk about you know, why rings matter and what are the rings and how they work. We're going to get uh, some deeper stuff. And then also, as an aside, um, we're really thinking about people that are operating Swift clusters and try to give some tips so that people can understand how to use them and how to do cool things with them and how they sort of power different things that you can do in your Swift clusters. Yeah. So that said, uh, this is not Swift 101, uh, actually. So if you're looking for a more general introduction into Swift, there have been some great talks in the past. Uh, we have a few links for, for you here uh, listed. And uh, if you're not one to watch videos, um, maybe you want to read a little bit more about this, uh, there's also some, something li linked on the slide here with a very br short, well, with a short introduction to Swift itself and the concepts behind Swift. Um, so if you're interested in that, uh, please have a look at this. All right. Yeah. All right, so the first thing, why the heck are we talking about rings? Um, Rings are, you know, it's, it's one of the basic tenets of the architecture of Swift. And uh, it's a really important concept that sort of permeates throughout the system. Uh, it is not uh, just merely an implementation detail. Uh, Swift's are, uh, rings are actually a really important component of its architecture, and they enable a lot of different things. Uh, particularly anyone that's operated a Swift cluster um, understands that uh, you know, it's not your typical sysadmin. Swift operators are some of the best in the business. And they understand that even from the very beginning when they're configuring their Swift cluster, uh, they're you know, having to think about their cluster's topology of this distributed system. And you know, there's a lot of stuff that can be going on whenever you're running this large-scale distributed storage topology. Uh, and in particular, they're manipulating rings and ways and thinking about their clusters and how they're rebalancing and managing adding capacity. These guys are ring masters. Yeah, so that said, um, your rings contain, well, most of the information that is required to run a Swift cluster. Of course, all your devices are uh, contained within the rings, uh, your servers. But it's not only that. You have a uh, concept of zones where you group multiple servers, uh, for example, into a failure domain. Uh, you can uh, extend that a little bit more to regions. So you group servers and uh, zones into multiple regions if you, for example, run a geographically distributed cluster. So, for example, users might be able to store data both in the United States and in Europe, but at the same time you can use multiple rings with storage policies and that allows um, an operator or a user to actually decide where the data should be stored. So even if you have a geographically distributed cluster, you can decide, okay, this data should be only stored in Europe or this data should be only stored in, in the United States or wherever else. Uh, while other data at the same time should be stored completely distributed. Uh, this concept is made available by using storage policies, which basically allows you to, to use multiple rings uh, for objects, and you can even use, well, the default has been to use a replicated uh, uh, strategy for Swift for a long time, but with the concept of storage policies, you can use also a concept called erasure coding, which gives you um, well, a better usage of your devices because you don't need to store all the data, let's say, uh, three times replicated. Uh, you have less overhead here and um, that allows you to, to lower your costs significantly. 
And any one of these things you can kind of even go deeper into. Um, the devices, you might have different types of hardware in your cluster, like SSDs. Zones represent the failure domains that may take an impact on how you're thinking about upgrading your cluster. Uh, you know, of course, all the cross-region stuff that uh, you talked about. The storage policies each have their own ring, the same as the account container. Uh, so this is definitely not, you know, just something that doesn't matter. This is something that operators are thinking about as they're working through their Swift clusters. Um, so that's, that's why they matter. And what we hope to do here is talk a little bit about the data placement technology, the algorithms that go into Swift, so that you have some concepts that you can take back when you're thinking about your cluster topology and how you want to employ these rings to do some interesting things in your clusters. Um, luckily, Swift rings uh, are actually very simple. Consistent hashing has was first introduced back in 1997, which was the same year that HTTP 1.1 uh, RFC 2616 was approved. So this is, this is old tech, um, and it, it really is a simple idea on a way to distribute things. Yeah. So actually, uh, let's start a little bit uh, earlier. Let's assume you are a company and you want to archive some snail mail, classic letters, actually. And uh, you have a bunch of zip codes for different companies, for example. You have the zip code from Swift Stacks, the, uh, the zip code from Red Hat, and now you want to distribute your snail mails in an organized way into a limited number of boxes, actually, to archive them. Now, one approach that you could use, you track the zip codes and create a table. Okay, this zip code goes into that box and another zip code goes into this box. Well, that's a little bit complicated. The more zip codes you have, let's assume you have also the, or use also the company names, then you might have millions of these data sets. And Whenever a new zip code comes in, you need to update your tables. And if you have a distributed cluster, uh, it becomes really complicated. You need to update uh, and distribute all the stuff all the time. So an easier way to do this is actually to just use a distribution function and remember this function. So in this case, it's very simple. It's a modular operation. That's not exactly what, how it works in Swift, but for this example, uh, just take the zip code, apply a modular to it, and you know the number of the box where you want to put your uh, letter into. Now, this scales very well. Uh, it does, basically it doesn't matter uh, how many zip codes you have as an input. Um, it's still the same function, and you can easily uh, describe wh which box contains your letters. Now, within Swift, we are not using boxes. We are using partitions. So what we're doing is we take the object name, including the account and the container name, and that describes an, or is a namespace. And this namespace is actually mapped to a number of partitions within your Swift cluster. The Swift partitions are a fixed number. It's um, not a partition on your hard drive exactly in the way that it's, well, in a partition table, which you might be familiar with. Uh, it's really a directory if you look onto the disk. So if you go to one of your object servers, for example, and uh, just uh, do a deep dive into the directory the structure of Swift, you will see something like this. And at the end of, the, of this whole name, you will find some dot data. This is actually a replicated object. Um, but before that, you find some, well, cryptic looking stuff. And this is your partition number, which is computed actually from the object name. Uh, then you have the hashed object name itself and you have a suffix uh, used by or from the hashed object name and um, this describes another subdirectory. If you look into the source code of Swift and uh, start digging around uh, where, how this is made of, uh, you will see that we use a little bit different names here. So we have a partition deer, we have a suffix deer, and we have a hash deer. That are the names that we are using within the source code if you look into that. That's really all you have to remember if you're digging down yeah. in the Swift directories. Part, suffix, hash. Easy as that. Okay. All right. So uh, that's a little bit about uh, consistent hashing. We're going to be talking about the partitions that Swift is going to be mapping to devices. The um, if you've dealt with other consistent hashing algorithms, you may have heard them referred to as V nodes uh, or even buckets, uh, but Swift calls them partitions. So the reason that we refer to Swift as being a modified consistent hashing algorithm is because one of the things that we've added in addition to just splaying your namespace across all of your partitions uh, is they also have replicas. And one of the, really the, the key thing about the ring, the main data structure that it's distributing in addition to the, uh, the, the lookup function is the replicate apart to dev ID table. 
Uh, and it's actually a really simple thing. We call uh, these things rings, and I don't know why. They're actually more of a table. Uh, this is the main data structure, and all that it really says is that um, for each replica uh, of every single partition, we have to write down which device that thing is on. And that's it. This is essentially our address book. Uh, this data structure is large. There is a lot of partitions, 2 to the 10, 2 to the 16, depending on your part power. Uh, and your replicas, you might even have 7 or 8 or 10 if you're doing uh, erasure coded. Um, they're not actually repl replicas at that point. They're just fragments. Um, but if you understand that this is all this data structure is, you can put in you know, wherever you want those to go. You can write down um, those devices. Uh, but of course, that's actually the job of the ring code is to figure out which ones are the right ones to put there. Uh, once you have this table in hand, um, you can provide the main functions of the ring, which is to locate data on disks uh, or on the nodes specifically. Uh, we classify a placement of a partition in two categories. The main one is the primary lookup. Um, this comes out of the git nodes function. And basically, it's just an indexed lookup into the ring. Once you know the name of an object and you perform its hash and then you convert that modulo into your partition table, that gives you the part which you can just look up and it tells you exactly what the three or more. It's an indexed lookup directly into that uh, data structure. So it's very quick and you know exactly what the primary devices are. But in a uh, highly available system, the idea is that you know, at any time, one of these nodes or multiples of these nodes can be unavailable. And this is where Swift has to introduce a concept of handoffs. Uh, sometimes I think people get confused, that's actually what the function's called, that the handoff nodes are like written down, it's something that we know, and I think that it's really important that we take away that the handoff nodes are actually just a deterministic function. You can ask, get more nodes for as many um, more locations as you want. If, if one of them is available, you can always get another one because it's just an algorithm that traverses through that table, throwing out different uh, devices that are in a similar failure domain, uh, but you always get them back in the same order. It's deterministic, but we never write down the handoff nodes. Uh, it's just an algorithm, like this little factory here. Uh, okay, so we now know how a ring is used to provide Swift with the locations for the data that it needs to find, and we understand what that data structure looked like. Uh, but if it's just a consistent hashing algorithm where you have to keep track of multiple replicas, you know, why can't we just write down any devices in that table? Uh, and that's where we've learned over the years that there's some properties that make one ring good and one ring bad. So obviously a good ring is good. It's got good dispersion, good balance, low overload, a little bit, not too much. Uh, if you have a bad ring, you get these very helpful error messages that tell you exactly what's wrong. Uh, no, that's not exactly how it works. Rings are not good or bad. Rings are filling in a spectrum of gray. Uh, and there's a number of different trade-offs that you have to make whenever you're assigning um, partitions somewhere in your cluster, in the failure domain, trying to balance things out. So we're going to dive into some of these concepts so that as you're thinking about your ring and you're understanding the feedback from the um, balancing, uh, the rebalance operation, you have some ideas that you can sort of map that to and understand how it works out. All right. So the rebalance algorithms actually a little, are a little bit constrained. Uh, so we have devices uh, where we want to distribute our partitions to, but of course we don't do that randomly. Uh, we want to take into account that these devices are attached to actual servers. These servers are grouped within zones, uh, which might be actually your racks. So if you have multiple racks, um, you put a few of these servers into one rack, a few other servers into another rack, and even if a full rack might be uh, unavailable, for example, a switch error, power outage, whatever, uh, that Swift is still operatable and can still re um, return the data back to you that you stored earlier. And if you have multiple data centers, you can even use or assign uh, servers and groups into these uh, multiple data centers, multiple regions, and the algorithm actually needs to find a way how to balance this all out and uh, how to assign partitions and especially the replicas to different failure domains. When you look into the source code uh, of the Swift ring building algorithm, you will see that we often use the term tiers. So these are actually tiers. Uh, a region tier has, for example, multiple zone tiers. A zone tier has then multiple uh, device tiers and so on and so forth. What is important is that a failure domain fails together. So uh, if you have a single server and all your replicas are stored on the single server, it will fail together. That, that's actually bad, right? So you need to know your failure domains. Uh, for example, as I said earlier, power outlets, network switches, stuff like that. 
uh, maybe even different parts within the same data center. For example, if you have uh, fire walls between these, uh, just to be sure that in case there is a fire in one part of the data center that your data is still uh, stored safely. Now, let's have an actual look. Uh, so, uh, what happens within Swift itself? We have a bunch of buckets here. And these buckets might be disks, actually. Now, these buckets hold partitions, and the partitions hold our object data. And um, in a well-balanced cluster, everything is distributed very, very well uh, and uh, assigned to all nodes. Let's have a look at a specific partition that holds actually three replicas. So these re three replicas are, for example, one object, or a photo, a video, whatever. Now, these disks are normally assigned to a server, right? So you have, for example, six disks attached to one server and six other disks uh, attached to another server. Now, the bad thing is here, if that server fails, you will have a very unhappy user, and probably a very unhappy operator afterwards as well. So the, uh, the ring algorithms actually need to find a way how to distribute this in a better way. So at least one replica should be stored on the other server, in the other failure domain. And even if the, the server on the left side fails, your uh, user will still be very happy because he, can still, he or she can still um, retrieve the data back later on. We have actually a term for this, uh, and we call this dispersion which is actually a measurement um, if, if there's a risk that we lose a, a replica or, a, a, yeah, a replica if a failure domain is not available, if it's as unique as possible. So the best case would be you have a dispersion of zero. Uh, in that case, even if, uh, if one of your uh, failure domains is actually unavailable, uh, it will be available using a different failure domain, hopefully. So, when you have two failure domains, actually, uh, and you uh, distribute three replicas across these two failure domains, that should be fine, actually. Uh, if one of them fails, uh, you're still in a good shape. But, well, if you add, for example, another zone, another failure domain, more servers, and uh, one of your, the both left uh, failure domains are out of, uh, out of service, well, then it gets complicated again. The rings are blaming us again, and um, data is unavailable, and well, that's not what we want. Right. Yeah, I mean, the key thing there is just that it doesn't mean that you only have one replica. It's just as unique as possible. So if you have as many failure domains as replicas, then your replicas should be spread out evenly among them. And if that's not the case because of some of these other constraints, that will lead to bad dispersion. So it's important that uh, you understand what those dispersion numbers are trying to tell you. There's other tools to help you out. Got to balance the rings. Looking at another example, so it, we have this fundamental constraint of dispersion. Uh, one of the ideas you know, that you would have is just let's just put one replica evenly across all of our failure domains. I mean, particularly here, we have three failure domains. Uh, and replacing, say, five partitions, we just put one in each one of the failure domains and we just sort of keep this up and things are going fine until suddenly we see, okay, on these two on yeah, you're right. Uh, you see that we're already having some devices that have multiple replicas in it, and on the server on the left, we don't have any uh, replicas in there. Uh, and if you keep this up for a while, things are going to continue to get more and more overloaded in uh, the uh, servers on the right and less and less overloaded on the left. And that's really... Uh, you know, just sort of an example of what can happen at a larger scale if you have very imbalanced uh, regions, uh, or in this case servers, um, you know, we've got some server devices that have multiple replicas on them and then we have uh, some devices that are not being used at all. And this is not going to be a satisfactory uh, placement algorithm. Even though everything is fully dispersed, we don't have a situation where our capacity is being evenly used. Nobody wants to, no one's going to be satisfied if the failure, if the uh, storage system is just not using some of the available capacity. Uh, so that's a couple of things. We want to take a break now and talk about um, what happens when you do Swift Ring, uh, uh, Swift Ring Builder rebalance uh, to a ring. Yeah, so actually rebalance happens if you, for example, add a new capacity to your rings. What you want to do is that the existing data is distributed well after you added new capacity, right? You start with 10 servers. Most of them, they are maybe uh, full already. You add 10 more servers. Now you want to have these 20 servers maybe uh, with a fill level of 50% or something like that. So that's where the rebalance progress comes into play. 
Uh, again, a simple example. Uh, you have four buckets uh, and you have three replicas. These are stored some way uh, or distributed some way like this, for example. And uh, now you assign or trigger a rebalance actually, which is a command that you apply to your ring, not even on the cluster. It could be on an operator's notebook or somewhere else. And uh, the rebalance algorithm will tell you or will tell the ring, okay, this is your new distribution. So before we had one copy or one replica on the lower right and this replica should actually move to the upper right uh, bucket, right? Well, it's not as easy as that. Um, actually, this introduces a failure. So the replica is not immediately moved, right? If I rebalance my ring and push the ring out to the whole cluster, the ring knows, okay, I expect my data on the upper right node. But the data might not be there yet. Uh, it still needs to be replicated to this cluster. So you have a failure, actually. The proxy will work around this. So the proxy knows, OK, if one copy is not there, it will try another copy. So it will still find copies on the nodes on uh, your right, on the right side. And it will work around this. But uh, it's a little bit more complicated. So if you rebalance multiple times in a row, for example, and in that case, you would introduce more failures. And it might happen that all three replicas are now or should now be moved to a different node, to a different disk. And all of them are now unavailable. So you clearly want to avoid this. That's the reason why the rebalance algorithm only moves a single replica at a time. So uh, when you call it once, only one replica will move. Now, when you call it a second time, it will, might move another copy. And to limit this a little bit, we have another constraint, which is the min part hours. So the min part hours tells the, or, well, tells the algorithm, okay, you are only allowed to move one replica within a given time range. That might be one hour or 24 hours, whatever is suitable to your cluster. So before you, before you finished repli a full replication cycle, you should not rebalance the same ring again. All right. Um, now, normally you have a few more uh, partitions per disk, right? You don't have only a single partition per disk. You would have more data. Uh, in this case, we have three partitions uh, distributed across four buckets. And each of them has three different replicas stored onto different nodes. And uh, now we're adding more capacity. Now, these new buckets are a little bit bigger than the old ones. Um, we have another concept within the Swift rings called weights. The weight is actually telling the algorithm, okay, this bucket is much bigger and this bucket can hold more partitions. So that we get a, well, somehow balanced usage on each of the disks. So even if you have, let's say, two terabyte disks in your cluster, they should have a fill level of, let's say, 75%, but, the, uh, but your 10 terabyte disks next year should also have a 75% fill level. All right. So the rebalance algorithm assigned new data, uh, new uh, locations for the replicas or for some of the replicas. But uh, now we need actually to move that. So, and that's part of the replication algorithm. And what you can see here is the replication algorithm will try to, well, distribute the data across multiple target, uh, target buckets, basically. Might be disks, might be servers. So the replication and the rebalance uh, procedure process will actually move some data, but it's only a single replica at a time, uh, as you can see here. I just said only rebalance uh, one time after a full, or only rebalance again after a full replication cycle. Uh, now you actually need to know, okay, when is my full replication cycle uh, done, right? So one option might be to, to have a look to your log files, but that's a little bit a tedious process, especially with larger clusters when you have like 100 nodes and you need to query all, all of them. There is a very useful tool for this. It's called Swift Dispersion Report. Swift Dispersion Report creates um, some small objects distributed across your cluster and, uh, well, uh, yes, and the dispersion report itself will then query all of the replicas. So it will now, after a, a rebalance uh, algorithm comes into play, okay, some copies might not be available, some replicas, um, and it will tell you this. So for example, this output uh, happened with a three replica 
uh, cluster. Uh, we did a large change there and only 79% of the data or of the object replicas are uh, available at the moment. So with, with three replicas you should be all the time between 66% and 100%, so the number uh, 79% uh, should increase because the replicators fix the problems for you and will move the replicas into the correct place. Uh, all right, so let's take a look at this more. I got some visual props to sort of help us out. This is a little setup that I had uh, where I was uh, had a standing um, setup in DFW, and then I was adding a region in Sydney. Um, and you can see during the first crank of the rebalance of the ring, we only had a thousand. Th these uh, devices were actually these servers all actually had the same amount of storage capacity. But in the first crank of the rebalance, uh, I didn't assign as many partitions uh, to them. We did a gradual weight increase, uh, and so you can see there's less partitions assigned. Um, and then you can also see uh, that in the standing nodes down in DFW, we had a lot more uh, actual capacity on disk, actual physical weight on the devices, and the SID region was starting to fill up. Uh, so that's kind of an idea on what's going on in the rebalance. You've got uh, the, the capacity filling across. Um, so looking at it another way, uh, this is uh, another way to think about it. Uh, you have all of your primary partitions uh, that we talked about. Those are the assigned locations on the disk, uh, actually in the ring, in the replicate apart to dev table. And then you have your handoff partitions, which are partitions that are not supposed to be on this disk. They're assigned elsewhere. And you see right here, we made our first ring push. And that immediately, like Christian was talking about, introduces a fault into the cluster. Suddenly, a bunch of partitions are not in the right place. The total number of partitions didn't change but our representation of them did, and that's why that big red dip comes down. And you can see slowly as that green line is pushing up, as the replication is actually pushing uh, the uh, partitions out, and in this small cluster everything sort of finished at the same time. Finally, once all of the partitions were actually out in the primary locations, then the St uh, standing nodes that were holding the handoff partitions were able to delete their local copy. Uh, this is why whenever you see uh, new rings come out into the cluster that you're going to uh, see the total capacity used go up for a while because you have to replicate them out first, then you can delete the ones that you have. Uh, but as soon as they, uh, everything was synced out, they were able to validate that the uh, replica was fully uh, placed out on all the nodes, they could delete their local copy. You see those handoff partitions trending down, and as soon as it finished, we kick out that next ring. And so sort of the process repeats again. All right, so I think we have all the tools now to talk about what's going on in a rebalance um, and in particular uh, examine some cluster topologies whenever some of our fundamental constraints about balance and dispersion come in conflict with each other. Uh, so dispersion is all about spreading things out and it's about achieving highly availability uh, and balance is all about making the maximum usage of the capacity that's available. Uh, in most rings we can solve both of these things perfectly and just give you a ring that works really well uh, but in certain situations these can come into conflict and uh, I think we can, we can maybe look into why that's the case. Um, but to do so, we need some mental props that we can use to sort of think about how things work. Uh, and I'm going to introduce a concept to you that we use in the ring code, and hopefully you guys can follow along. Mental thought exercise here. Imagine that you have two failure domains and three replicas uh, of part worth of partitions that you want to place. Uh, so the first thing that you'll do is put uh, one replica's worth of partitions in one failure domain and the other, another replica's worth of partitions in the other's failure domain. That's only two. You still have one left. So you split it up, half in each. All right? So it's very easy to model this as just being 1.5, right? But it's 1.5 what? Well, it's, we call them replicants. It's not a third or a fourth or a fifth. It's a portion of a replica. It's a replicant, obviously. Uh, but what does that really mean? I mean, we can't split up a partition, but if you think of all the partitions that have multiple replicas, uh, you could say that, well, this has 1.5 replicants. It has a replica of every partition, that's the whole one, and then it has a 0.5 replicants, or you know, how many partitions have uh, two replicas here? Well, exactly half of them, uh, exactly half of your partitions have two replicas in this failure domain. And that's how that works out whenever you start to split things up. Uh, but we'll do another exercise and maybe get some better ideas on that. Uh, we're going to start with four, four zones. Um, one of them you can see, all right, I hope you guys can come along here. It's going to go fast. We're running out of time. Um, so 
first of all, you guys are going to have to give me some slack here. Let's say that these three are all equal in size. I mean, and uh, then this one up here, we're going to say is like twice as big. So if these four failure domains are sort of size like this, then we can think of it as having basically five different piece, you know, parts, units, if you will. Um, and then we're going to put three replicas into a cluster topology that looks like this. So if we want to put three replicas into five evenly spaced buckets, um, five units, then we can just divide it out and we can figure out that each one of these units is worth about 0.6. Is that right? Uh, double both of them, three, that's uh, six over ten, six tenths. Yeah, 0.6. So each one of these is about 0.6. All right, so if that was 0.6, then we're going to say that this is about one, one replica. And you can, you know, look, just, I've drawn this in crayon here. Cut me some slack. It's a little bit longer than, you know, 0.6. If you just made it half and then doubled it, it's close enough. It's just a visual representation. But if we place one here and then we place 0.6 in all of these, uh, we haven't placed all of our replicas yet, right? All of our replicants. We've got 0 0.6, 0 0.6, 0 0.6 in the lower three. Um, and then another one, is that right? 2.8, you got. 1.2 plus 0.6, 1.8 plus another one. Yeah, 2.8. So there's still two left, two tenths of a replica. And where do they have to go? They have to go up here on the top. And actually, we sort of saw this coming. Uh, if we remember that this one was exactly twice the size, and each one of those is worth 0.6, then we know that this was going to hold more than one whole replica worth of partitions. So when we're looking at it here, we're actually holding two replicas of some partitions. Well, how many partitions are holding two replicas? Exactly 20%, exactly 0.2. And that's because whenever that works out, it's holding 1.2 replicants. So we don't want to do that. This is introducing uh, some risk into this failure domain. If we ever to lose this failure domain, that's multiple replicas at risk. In particular, during a rebalance, where we may have introduced a fault because we're changing where things are, to lose a single zone, have cut out two of our replicas, that means that at least 20% of our partitions are at high risk. So we don't want to assign it like this. We would rather assign those somewhere else. But these are already at capacity, these other, um, other zones that we have down here. And every time that we take some partitions out of the top, we have to assign them somewhere else, so we end up filling them in to these ones on the bottom. In fact, the more partitions that we take out of the larger, fatter zone, the more that go into the other ones that didn't want to hold it. And you can actually calculate how much you need to do this. Um, whenever we get done, uh, we know that we've assigned one whole replica to the top domain, and on the lower domains, we have to assign two left. There's two left. We have to split two replicants between these two. We know that they only wanted to hold 0.6, and we've pushed that up to two-thirds, 0.66 repeating. So it turns out that the amount of extra partitions that we have to assign into the failure domain uh, that um, down here on the, on the bottom is about 11% more. Somewhere between 11 and 12% overload allows this ring to have full dispersion. Um, and, you know, that's quite a lot. It's actually saying to us that if we allowed every single device in the ring to hold at most 11% more partitions than it would want by weight, and then we told the ring rebalancing algorithm to go at it, it would be able to give us a fully dispersed ring, but it does it at the cost of overloading the um, devices in these smaller failure domains up to as much as 10%, which can be quite a lot. Yeah, <clears throat> so actually uh, the overload factor, it was introduced very recently, like one or two releases ago, I think. Um, so it's not available if you're using an older OpenStack Swift version, but it's, it's a good idea to actually use it, uh, so, but don't use a value that is too high because then your drives are filling up. If you're not using not enough, uh, then you might run into the problems that you just saw. And um, actually, well, if, if there's a disaster, well, hopefully you can recover somehow from that. But uh, just using a value of like 10% is probably fine in most use cases. Uh, maybe even 5%, but 10% is really a good way uh, to balance this out. Now. That would be fine, right? Be yeah. Fine. All right. So we talked about partitions, and um, actually we need to talk about partition power because when you create a ring, you set a value that is called partition power. Now, where is the partition power? Why is the partition power required, and what does it tell you? So actually we need to balance some unknown am amount of data coming in. So you have objects, for example, some of them are zero byte in size, others are five gigabyte in size. You don't know that in advance, right? 
and we just store them on disks. So some partitions might be actually using, well, let's say 10 gigabytes, two five gigabyte objects, while other partitions might just use a few bytes on the disk. So what you want to do is you want to assign multiple partitions per disk to, at the end of the day, balance out. So when you have, let's say, a thousand partitions, um, then the smaller ones together with the bigger ones, it will uh, balance out uh, when you distribute this across a cluster. So let's give an example about this. Uh, let's assume you have a single partition per disk. And uh, when you do that and you uh, put random data, random sized data uh, onto this uh, cluster, you will see that some of your disks are actually already filled to 100%. Others are only filled maybe to 78%, while the average is about like 86%. At least, well, you see that it's not very well balanced. So we're going to increase the partition numbers per disk. Let's say 10 partitions. That's much better already. Uh, you are again at 100% because the cluster is already full. Uh, well, at least for some disks. And now you have an average value of 95% per disk, which is much better than before because you're not throwing away uh, unused disk space on some of your disks. If you go to 100 partitions per disk, then you will see that it bands out very well. Most of the, uh, the average is about 99%. So you have very little difference between all of these disks and your cluster. Now, you could have the idea or get the idea that it might be a good idea to just increase this number further and further, right? Just use a million partitions per disk. Uh, that's a bad idea, actually. Um, so the replication time will go up and it will like take weeks, if not months, if you do that. So you need to somehow find a way to assign a specific number of partitions per disk that is balancing this out and at the same time uh, give you some good replication time. So th the problem here is that the partition power is fixed. You set it once and you can't change it uh, afterwards anymore. So if you add more disk to your cluster and you spread out the existing number of and the fixed number of partitions to your increased cluster, you have less partitions per disk now, right? So a good way is actually to choose a partition power with only, well, let's say a thousand partitions or a few thousand partitions at maximum per disk based on today's need. Don't shoot for the stars and imagine that you're going to be the next Facebook if, you don't, if you're not sure about that, uh, storing the next uh, few dozens and, of exabytes. So when you do that, it is also very unlikely that you have a partition power that is larger than, or well, much larger than 20. So it's tw two to the power of 20. And uh, 32 is our actual maximum. It's definitely not 32, absolutely not. And if you're um, not sure about uh, selecting a partition power, come either uh, or join us on the IRC channel, ask us about that, or just use Clay's tool. Clay has a tool, uh, written a tool, a small Python script. Uh, you just enter the number of disks that you have, and it will give you an estimation what it might be a good value for you. Yeah. My observation has just been that people tend to use their cluster uh, before they add capacity to it. And if you're planning on getting use out of your cluster, you need to plan for today. Uh, luckily, the way that that exponential growth works out and the way that the balancing works out, if you just use the same amount of partitions for today, you'll be able to scale that cluster one or two orders of magnitude uh, before you have any sort of trouble with uh, the balancing stuff that Christian was talking about. All right. However, <laughs> sometimes you become a unicorn, right? Uh, and you are the next Facebook, the next Flickr, and you are storing billions of cat pictures, whatnot, and you have a skyrocketing growth. And actually, in this case, well, you're, you remember the partition power is fixed. You still want to have a balanced cluster, right? Uh, we're working on that. Um, so we're working on a way to increase the partition power, actually. Uh, there's a patch, patch available. Uh, have a look if you're interested in that. But keep in mind that it will probably never be possible to decrease the partition power, at least not with a significant and serious downtime. It's only possible, or hopefully becoming possible in the future, to increase the partition power. So it shouldn't be a big problem if you select the same number or the same uh, partition power today and um, get Happy much bigger in the future. Yeah. Yeah. Christian got you covered. Yeah, yeah hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So there was a lot of information. Um, Let's do a quick wrap up um, and just repeat all these keywords that we uh, saw uh, in the last uh, 30, 35 minutes. What's a good cluster? Let's assume you have four servers. You, these four servers all have eight disks, four terabyte in size. You assign a way to them, this 4,000 here. Uh, it's just a random value, but, uh, well, not a random value, it's just a value, but it, it matches your uh, capacity of your disk in the cluster. Now, 
these four servers uh, need some partition power. So in this case, I choose 14. That gives me about 16,000 partitions. Uh, I'm using three replicas, a total of 32 disks uh, within my cluster, and it will end up with about 1,500 partitions per disk, which is fine for today, but gives you enough room uh, to grow uh, the cluster to about, let's say, 15, 15 times uh, the current size, maybe even 20 or 30 times the size. Uh, that should work out very fine. Now, your servers are probably not all located in a single rack. You have multiple racks, so you put them into different zones. Uh, these are your failure domains, actually. So you have two failure domains here, and uh, for example, attached to each rack and switch. Okay, time passes, you add more servers. These servers only have six disks, but you have new disks. These are five terabytes in size, so you, ha you use a different weight to uh, tell the ring algorithms, okay, these guys are a little bit bigger than the other ones. And um, actually, these new servers are in a new data center. So you introduce or use the concept of regions to tell the algorithm, OK, these are my disks and my servers in my main data center, while these are my second data center, right? All right. So if you sum up all these values, then you will see that my two zones uh, on the left side will each hold about 64 terabyte of data, while the region 2 can only hold 60 terabyte of data. Now, I want to store three replicas that won't match, right? That's a problem we talked about earlier. Uh, I can't find an exact value how to ensure that there is at least one replica of each object in region number two, at least not if I follow this uh, strict um, constraints. So I actually would need 60 point, 62.66 terabytes of free space in all these regions and zones to distribute it equally across my cluster. Now, uh, that actually means I need to use an overload factor. And so this uh, ring builder tool will tell you, OK, this overload factor would fix your problem. In this case, it would be 4.5%. 4. And um, as Clay said earlier, 10% is probably fine. Mm -hmm. It fit, uh, fits this Yeah, in fact, if you're following the advice that we've given and you're creating your new rings with an overload of about 10%, the ring will automatically use exactly just the 4.5. It only takes advantage of as much as it needs to. It is striving to optimize for balance, uh, but it'll actually optimize perfectly for balance unless you allow it to over-assign your devices a little bit. In this case, you know, you're going to see a little bit extra weight on the devices in region two, uh, maybe as much variance as an extra 5%, you know, beyond that little bit of variance that you normally get just between parts in general. All right. That should be fine, right? But it, yeah, I mean, that, that yeah, should be fine. version zero, that's great. All right. I think it was a very I can't believe we managed to do it. Yeah. We did like 42 we minutes. Late. We just barely made it. Um, Hopefully you have some questions. We blasted you away, mm. it seems, yeah. It's all right. We'll okay. uh, make sure this gets up online and the yeah. slides get posted so that uh, you guys can look at it later. Does any of the Swift contributors have any questions or want to make any corrections? Actually, Clay, we forgot something. What's that? Composite rings. We didn't talk about composite rings. Yeah? Yeah? Sure, yeah. Composite rings is uh, something that uh, one of our uh, contributors from NTT is working on. Another, uh, Sam from Swissnack, has been looking at it. Uh, we are trying to change the way to give you more capabilities in the way that you manage uh, global clusters by having virtual rings and rings that are comprised of other rings. So uh, there'll be more stuff to talk about next time. Cool. Sounds great. Thanks.